Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, our transplant nephrologist, Dr. Faiwez Alamari, and, doc and transplant surgeon, Dr. Shane Oatman, will be speaking about living kidney donation, everything you should know. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type, type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation. So please note, if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check sent anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we received during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of the program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome our presenters to begin our presentation. We would like to thank uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine uh, for giving us this opportunity uh, to present everything you should know about living kidney donation. Uh, my name is Fawaz Alamari. Actually, I'm uh, very passionate about living kidney donation. I have uh, completed a PhD in health services research, and my thesis was increasing living kidney donation in the United States. Uh, also, you will hear from our uh, uh, director of the surgery, uh, living donor transplantation, Dr. Shane Oatman, uh, later on about the surgery. So we'd like to welcome our uh, uh, listener and thank you so much for joining us today. We have no uh, disclosure to, uh, for finance. And today we'll go over uh, background. We'll discuss uh, trends in living kidney donation in the United States. We'll talk about risk that a potential donor may take and what, who are eligible for kidney donation and what is the evaluation process and how does the surgery looks like and what about the follow-up care after donation. So why is this topic important? Well, we have in the United States over 700,000 uh, patients with kidney failure. And I just would like to highlight that the most common cause of kidney failure is diabetes and that, and then followed by uh, high blood pressure, which is called hypertension. And we have nearly 100,000 patients with kidney failure await kidney transplantation. Plus, there are 30,000 patients added every year to the uh, waiting list. And unfortunately, we see 5,000 uh, patients on the wait list die every year waiting transplant. So the number of kidney transplant achieved every year remains far below the need for kidney failure patient. This slide shows you that the top line here, the overall number of kidney transplantation. In 2019, we achieved 18,000 kidney transplant. Of those transplants, the red bar represents the disease donation, which is about 12,000, and the blue bar represents a living donation, which is about uh, six to 7,000. So two thirds comes from deceased donor and one third comes from living, uh, from living donor. We have a lot of efforts. We're trying to increase the number of transplant. And as I mentioned that we have over uh, or nearly 100,000 patients still waiting for kidney transplantation. So what is different between living donor uh, and deceased donor? Here are the key points that why a living donor is the optimal therapy for most patients with kidney failure. So let's talk first, how long a graft or a kidney transplant will last. So we expect 50% of the graft from a living donor will last for 15 years versus 10 years uh, from deceased donor. So uh, there is clearly a uh, uh, time uh, again here for survival of the graft. Another important point is how long a patient need to wait for kidney transplantation approximately less than one year for a living donor and uh, approximately about five years for a, a deceased donor. And that number vary by uh, many uh, conditions. And 
Another key point is the surgical schedule. It's more flexible, convenient for a living donor. They can pick the time, the season, when they are off work, and we can accommodate uh, the need for uh, the donor and the recipient. Uh, for a deceased donor, it's whenever they get called for a transplant, they have to show up immediately. Another key point is that uh, after transplantation, there is something called a delay graft function, which means that the recipient will need to be in dialysis for a shorter period of time. So if this is, uh, organ comes from a living donor, this risk is almost close to zero. It's about 2.6% nationally. If the, the donor was a deceased donor, this risk is about 27%. So no question that a living donor is the optimal therapy uh, for kidney transplantation, if all possible. Now, what types of kidney donation that we have? So the first type is called directed donation, when the donor and recipient uh, know each other, whether they are biologically related or unrelated. The other type of donation, we, we call it non-directed donation or altruistic, when a person chooses to donate a kidney to an unknown patient uh, who needs a transplant. And this we've been seeing uh, more increasing. Uh, uh, the last um, data I have seen uh, is about 5% of living donation. And this is really promising. And we thank all these people for doing this. So you may have heard about something called incompatible donor and recipient. What it means here, well, you may have a donor who is uh, blood type A and the recipient is blood type O. So in that case, uh, there is a blood type incompatibility. In this case, we have some option. Another way of incompatible uh, donor and recipient is the tissue type, where uh, the recipient may have antibody against the tissue type of the donor. So it is also called incompatible tissue type. So the first option we could do something called desensitization. What it means, uh, basically, we uh, try to uh, clean the antibody or reduce the antibody in the recipient in order to allow incompatible kidney transplant perform. But more optimal option is uh, kidney pair donation. This helps uh, find a donor uh, who is more compatible uh, with the recipient to a kidney exchange program, which called the kidney swap. So basically, what it means here maybe the first pair, donor one, is compatible with recipient two, who may be in the same city or in a different state in the United States, but they are compatible. So we can swab the donor one kidney with recipient two, and then donor two kidney could go to recipient one. Uh, and in this case, uh, when, when everyone got a kidney and uh, got a better match in this case. Uh, this can be also go on for multiple donor and multiple recipient, which is great. And really, you may save not only one life that you love uh, for your loved one, you may save many lives uh, in that case. So here I would like to show that the trends uh, in living kidney donation in the United States between 2005 and 2019. Uh, this actually is our group uh, work. We have published this uh, last year and we have an updated data published in uh, 2020. What we show here, uh, the uh, upper uh, line represents the overall number of living kidney donation in the United States. So we noticed that there has been a decline uh, since 2005 in living donation. And then we start to pick up in 2017, uh, back to 2019 here, uh, which back now to a uh, previous uh, 2005 number. And actually this is the first time in history uh, we have the highest number of living kidney donation is almost about uh, 7,000. Now, what we see, what, uh, what we see here is that uh, biologically related, who used to be historically the majority of donor has declined over time. And unrelated donor uh, has increased over time. And for the first time in history in 2019, unrelated donor became the majority of donors. And as you see at the bottom here, the blue bar represent kidney pair donation. Uh, this is the time where we talk about kidney swap. And when we looked more in depth about kidney pair donation, uh, some data suggests that about 75% of kidney pair donation come from unrelated donor. So this phenomena that uh, we show that uh, uh, why biologically related are declining over time, 
we have uh, no specific reason to see this, but we have concluded that we would like biologically related donor to come forward, particularly those who are at low risk, uh, who are that uh, we, we call them like at all uh, older age, like uh, 50 and above or 40 years and above, they will be uh, an optimal donor for the uh, recipient. So uh, I want to jump here to the next slide where we show nationally, uh, the donor can come from uh, outside the, uh, the United States. Here we show that the, uh, the darker color where, uh, where international donor came from. So we saw from Mexico, from Canada, from Gulf countries, India, Philippines. So we can take donor from anywhere in the world as long they are uh, eligible and they meet, we have strict criteria they have to meet uh, and otherwise uh, we'll help them to bring them here. In our study, we showed this donor about 75% they were biologically related with the recipient in the United States. So I want you guys here now to take a deep breath and now we'll talk about risk uh, that a kidney donor may take. So what is the risk for death within 90 days after kidney donation? Uh, our group actually showed this risk is very small. It's about three per 10,000 donor. Uh, which means basically 0.03%. Another uh, risk that a donor will take is that increase in blood pressure, about five millimeter mercury increase over that anticipated with normal aging increase in blood pressure after five years from donation. Also our group uh, showed that a 19% higher risk of high blood pressure or what we call hypertension a living donor compared with healthy non-donor. The key message here is that uh, hypertension is a, a real risk for donors. However, we always advise our donor to keep healthy lifestyle, maintain their weight within normal range, exercise to maintain their blood pressure within normal range in the future. And if in any case that they develop high blood pressure, they will need to be a medication to be uh, well controlled. What about young woman who may be interested to donate uh, a kidney and that she's worried about her future risk uh, in pregnancy? So this study came from Canada that they showed that among living kidney donors, women uh, who had pregnancy, 11% will develop a gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, which basically a disease uh, with a high blood pressure uh, that happens late in pregnancy after 20 weeks of pregnancy. When they compared to this to among healthy women who were non-donor and became pregnant, the risk was 5%. So there is like kind of double risk uh, uh, having this during pregnancy, but uh, uh, the majority of our donors who donate the kidney, they did very well, but a young woman should have this into consideration. Uh, I think an important risk that we, you should know that the risk of kidney failure is not zero. So our group uh, showed in this study that uh, among living kidney donor, the risk of kidney failure uh, in 15 years is 0.31%. It's basically less than 1%. And if you compare this to healthy non donor, it's 0.04%. So um, again, the risk is increased, is not zero, but it's still a very low risk, is uh, lower than 1% within 15 years after donation. So what about like a, a donor may develop a kidney failure in the future, which is again, is rare, but if it happens, what we can do? Uh, well, we owe our donors and we wanna protect them. So that person would receive priority on kidney transplant waiting list with a high quality disease kidney donor as long as they're surgical candidate and they are referred to transplant center. So now I wanna talk about hopes, what we can do moving forward. So living donors, the gift of life. We really wanna increase the living donor pool safely and we wanna reduce the wait time and death rate on the kidney transplant waiting list for kidney uh, failure patient. So let's talk about who is a good candidate to donate a kidney. If you are 18 years or older and healthy, you may qualify to donate the kidney and save a life and improve the quality of life for that recipient. What are some reasons that make someone want to donate a kidney? So what we have seen most people donate a kidney to a family member, a friend, or a life partner. However, we have seen 
increasingly, uh, people will donate a kidney to an unknown person on the waiting list that they don't know, which we, uh, we call it a non-directed donation or altruistic donation that we talked uh, about earlier. But uh, a donor should know that there is a need for commitment and there is cost associated. So uh, first I wanna say uh, this living donation must be completely voluntary and no, has no uh, pressure on the donor. And the donor can uh, step back at any point in the process and give up this process at any point. And living donors uh, also need to have a preparation for physical and emotional support uh, during recovery to make sure they, they have a, a good and uh, convenient recovery. Uh, in terms of cost, uh, uh, most of the costs directly related to the donation will be covered by recipient insurance. That includes evaluation, all tests done, surgery, and uh, some of the follow-up care. Now, but you have to know there are some costs that will not be covered by recipient insurance. That include basically uh, time off work, travel expenses, and treatment for uh, unrelated condition. Uh, for some donor, we have some funds if they need some help, if they're qualified, uh, there are some ways that uh, this could be also helped. So I want to uh, talk about what are the misconceptions about living donation. So I have heard this all the time, upper age limit, I cannot donate because I'm an older person. Well, that's not true. We see actually older donor may be preferable uh, in some cases because they can we see at lowest risk. Uh, when we screen donor, remember that uh, an older person who is screen healthy, that their chance of getting kidney failure in the future is way low than a younger, a younger person that we don't know what's gonna happen to them in the future. So uh, basically we have no upper age limit, as long as you are healthy and you have adequate a kidney function, you are more, you are more welcome than to uh, come forward. Another misconception is that I have to be perfect match with the recipient. I have to have same blood type, I have to have a good tissue type. Well, that's not true. Uh, actually, we have uh, shown earlier that we have a lot of methods that we can accommodate, uh, including desensitization or using the kidney swab. So we really uh, here, uh, we encourage, if you are healthy and you have adequate kidney function and you are 18 years or older, come forward, we'll support you, we'll help you and we'll help the recipient to move forward. Uh, and then here, I want to say this about uh, some medical condition that may prevent someone from kidney donation uh, for sure. So if a donor has uh, inadequate kidney function prior to donation, then that's uh, exclusion. Uh, basically, we want a, a person must have appropriate kidney function before donation. Another issue of somebody has diabetes, which is basically elevated blood sugar or medication then this person will not donate. And the reason we're saying that, because diabetes is the most common cause of kidney uh, failure. Another topic that's commonly uh, been asked is uh, a person who have high blood pressure on medication. So a person must have normal blood pressure, but certain older person who are 50 years or older who have well controlled blood pressure on one or maybe like two moderate doses medication of therapy may donate a kidney as long they have no other medical risk. Obesity is um, a common public uh, health in the United States and maybe across the globe. Uh, it is associated with the high blood pressure, diabetes, high blood cholesterol. Therefore, we exclude donor with severe obesity. In general, a healthy uh, person should have a healthy lifestyle, exercise, maintain body weight with normal range. And that's what we would like our donor to be. So now, what is the road uh, to become a living donor? Um, well, first, we cannot ignore uh, this unprecedented uh, uh, time with COVID-19 pandemic going on in the United States and in the world. So this slide shows the number of living kidney donor transplant in the United States by week. So if you look in January 2012, uh, and sorry, in January uh, 12th week in 2020, uh, the number of donors were almost above 150. It dropped down close to zero uh, uh, late uh, March and early April because of the pandemic. And that's a normal reaction because we want to protect our uh, living donor that they don't expose to risk. 
And then we learn how to uh, deal with this process and how to move this uh, safely. So now the number is picking up. We're still far behind, but we're, we're learning more how to uh, go back to our uh, normal uh, living donation uh, number. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, many transplant center has adopted uh, what's called telemedicine, where we do the initial evaluation using video visit after the donor have lab test and blood test and make sure they're uh, counseled and they're uh, uh, you know, still committed to the process, then we can bring them for a quick uh, physical exam and imaging and a much easier uh, visit rather than come from the beginning for a full evaluation. So we are always with our donor, we are always working for the safety of our donors. Uh, no, th there is no doubt about that. Um, here I wanna just summarize the evaluation process for living kidney donation. So uh, let's say someone is interested in being a donor. So the first thing is called referral. Basically, you can give us a phone call and we'll provide this at the end. Uh, or uh, there is, if you go to our website online, there is uh, an online form you fill out. It's very simple. You just ask about your medical history or some question, just to make sure that you don't have any medical uh, issue. And then once you pass this history, this will be brought to us. And if things are going well, really, like for example, you have no diabetes, no heart disease, and things look okay, we'll send you an order for blood and urine test wherever you are in the world. And you do this test, and if you pass this test, then we'll schedule you for uh, evaluation and counseling visit. And for your convenience, this can be done in person where you can come visit us physically at Johns Hopkins, or we can do it also by telemedicine uh, wherever you are in the United States in this case. If you pass this and you do do it okay and everything everything is going well, we'll bring you uh, for an imaging visit, that which could be done during your first visit evaluation in person, or could be ordered later on if you did telemedicine, and go on. And then there will be a committee. Will uh, they will uh, decide if you're safe to donate, and then if you're safe, you will move forward with your schedule for surgery. And we will be accommodating your time convenient, and we'll we'll try to accommodate you as much as we can. And then after that, there will be a follow-up care. Just to remind you, our donor must meet a strict criteria for consideration to ensure their short and long-term safety. And in that, uh, right now, I would like to invite Dr. Shane to talk to us about the surgery. Yeah. I, um, thank you for your interest in being a living donor. It's a big deal. The uh, I want to go back to a couple of issues. The NKR, sometimes the NKR, the National Kidney Registry of the Exchange, it... Um, some donors and some recipients have concerns because they are worried that, that their loved one's not going to get a kidney. We have done this. Me personally, I've done it. You know, I've shipped over 50 kidneys, maybe 60 or 70 now, and it's never been an issue. And, and you know, across the country, we've had great success with it. It's allowed us to uh, get people transplanted without having to do the severe manipulation of the immune system that we used to have to do. We still have to do that sometimes, but it's a way for us to get people transplanted without having to um, put the recipient through quite as much. Um, the living donor cost, we have social workers that'll work with the donors um, with various programs to help them offset some of their costs. It's not available to everyone based on income, but some people, um, it is there for them. I'd like to also stress that you don't just help the one that you're, uh, the recipient, um, but you help somebody else because if you donate a kidney, your, your intended recipient gets a kidney from you, and then that frees up a kidney from the list for somebody else who doesn't have a living donor. Um, if you don't end up meeting all the criteria to be a living donor, you also, um, I wanna stress you can be an advocate for your recipient. And I think one of the hardest things for recipients to do is ask somebody to be a donor for them. So even if you can't be a donor, um, I wanna stress that you can be an advocate for that individual and you can go to the community and you can, um, friends and uh, church members or, or whoever to, um, to try to help your recipient find a, a potential donor. Um, you, you know, if you do donate, you are a patient for life. If you have a problem in the future, we want to know about it. Even if you think it's unrelated, um, please let us know. Uh, and that doesn't matter how far into the future it is. We still want to know how you're doing. Lastly, if you donate, um, you know, we, we encourage you to take care of yourself. So, you know, don't, don't um, 
it's very easy to gain weight as you as you get older and every decade people gain you know more weight so take care of yourself uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle don't start smoking if you didn't smoke before and so on and um, so forth Fawaz, can you go to the next uh yeah thanks uh, one slide go back um so sorry so the surgery it is almost always done laparoscopically or robotically. Um, very rarely we will do an open mini uh, flank incision for people that have had uh, a lot of previous abdominal surgery, but that's rare. Um, whether we do it laparoscopically or robotically, um, the, the ports are virtually almost in, this, in a similar location. And um, as far as complications, as Fawaz says, the two big complications, although rare, are death and future kidney failure. Um, smaller complications are certainly real, and it's, it is major surgery and, um, you know, wound problems, hernias, uh, need to return to the operating room, all those things do happen. They are very uncommon. About, you know, one in 50 uh, donors will have some problem, whether that's a wound problem, um, a hernia, uh, you know, some, some issue that has to be addressed, but the vast majority of people donate and um, have no further problems. And, and probably, again, it's you know 98% of patients. Uh, next, uh, next slide. So this is uh, just a diagram with um, all kind of to give you an idea where the incisions could be. The incision, uh, there needs to be one larger incision to take the kidney out. And that's usually done either via the midline or the lower abdominal incision. Um, there are several of us here that do living donor, uh, the, the donor nephrectomy operation. And you know it could be at either site. Uh, most of us use the lower abdominal incision, but sometimes we'll occasionally use the upper, the midline incision. There are somewhere between four and five small incisions, anywhere between five millimeters and 10 millimeters for um, cameras and, and working ports for the instrument or the robot arms. Next slide. So the vast majority of donors come in and they go home on post-op day or two or three. Occasionally, someone uh, still not tolerating a diet well or has some pain issues, and they go home post op day four. Um, the the and occasionally you'll get somebody that'll go home on post op day one. That's a that's a rare individual. Um, most people, you know, the after the surgery, they're on clear liquids the night of surgery. The next day, the Foley catheter comes out. Their diet is advanced, um, and uh, again, the best case scenario is people go home the night of post op day one. Occasionally. Uh, post-op day four, but most people go home post-op day two or three. Um, very rarely do you have any staples that need to be taken out. Um, usually it's all stitches on the inside that dissolve and glue. Uh, Fawaz, you have a next slide there. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lakshin, for explaining this. This is really great. And uh, again, we want to stress out, this is really a small risk uh, surgery procedure. Uh, as Dr. Michelle mentioned, it's uh, done uh, laparoscopically uh, nationally. Uh, it's uh, extremely rare to be open surgery. So I just want to say that the donor will come to our uh, clinic in one or two weeks after donation to make sure they're uh, healing well. And then we will uh, send them blood and urine tests at six month, 12 month, and 24 month uh, to ensure their good recovery. And this is basically also required by uh, United States policy for organ donation. As Dr. Shane mentioned that if a donor develops a medical problem after donation, we wanna know about it and uh, we're, uh, please uh, encourage uh, our donor to contact us and we'll be happy to provide uh, all help we can. And uh, last uh, uh, but uh, not least, so I wanna say that why choose uh, Hopkins uh, for kidney donation? Well, first, donor safety comes first. Uh, second, I would say our group has a novel method to accommodate incompatible kidney transplant. And uh, last but not least, Johns Hopkins is a leading center uh, for outcome research uh, of living kidney donor, which helps us to use best practices uh, for our donors. So again, I wanna thank you for being with us today and we are happy to take questions. You know, uh, Dr. Alamari, there are several questions. The first one is, I was told throughout the process when test results have become, have, are longer than a year out, they will need to be redone. Is this all tests or just specific procedures? Um, you will have to repeat some tests, mainly, you know, your metabolic screening and your labs. 
Uh, your CT scan is usually, it's not necessary to repeat that. If your labs are, if your repeat labs are okay, you, you know, you're not gonna have to redo a study to confirm your um, renal function uh, generally. But a year, you know, cancer screening would have to be redone for some things. Um, if you're a female, you might, you know, you're, you're gonna have to get another mammogram and whatnot. Um, the second question is after a person donates a kidney, are they considered to have a pre-existing condition? That is a good question that I don't know if Dr. Alamari knows the answer sure. to that or yeah. not, but I, yeah. I think in general, it, you, that may depend on your insurance company. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure, sure. I can take this. So, uh, well, first, uh, living donor, uh, we uh, have been uh, supportive of our donors that this should not be a pre-existing condition uh, because you are healthy donors. However, we always encourage our donor to check with their insurance if there is any uh, consequences of that. Uh, we see sometimes life uh, insurance, sometimes they give hard time to our donors. We, again, we are supportive of our donors. We uh, sometimes we have written letters of support. This should not be deal as the existing condition. Now, I wanna say that some donors may develop some issues like for example, if their kidney function goes below expected number and they may be uh, labeled at lower kidney function. From our expertise, we don't see this as a chronic kidney disease. We see it as lower kidney function in a healthy donor. As of today, uh, this is still a complex question. Uh, uh, I think our uh, straightforward answer is, we would like to check with your insurance that, uh, uh, and to make sure this shouldn't be a problem because it may in some cases be a problem and also it may affect life insurance. And then uh, I think the question, the next question is after a person donates a kidney, are they considered to have, uh, I think we're answering this think, question. I think yeah. it's just a repeat of the same question. Yeah. Was, yeah. Looks and like then, uh, this next question is about NASH F2 be considered as a kidney donor if they are otherwise healthy. Uh, so certainly if you have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis um, and fatty liver disease, in general, no. Um, but you know, we would want to review the records, make sure we think that it is a real diagnosis of NASH and confirm whether it was biopsy proven um, or not. Uh, if you if somebody is a donor and they have NASH and they have uh, if they have modifiable risk factors, then potentially they could be a donor in the future. Um, Certainly people that have a BMI of over 30 and they have a diagnosis of NASH, if they get within a normal BMI and their labs look okay and their imaging looks okay, it is possible for them to be a donor. We would just we would have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and then also for the NASH question, also I would add, Shane, that the age is a very uh, a big player factor. So if you are 40 years old and you have NASH, that's not good. If you are 60 years old and otherwise healthy and we do all screening and we get clearance from a specialist, we may do it. So it's really uh, depends uh, case by case. Now, uh, question number four is, do you do genetic testing for donors? Do you screen living donors uh, for APL1 PKD? That's a great question. So uh, we do genetic testing based case by case. For example, uh, for APL1, which is uh, 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 we do for black donors, we believe that every black donor should be offered the APO1 testing and they have the right to uh, accept or refuse it, but we should offer them uh, the test. In terms of PKD, uh, yes, we do uh, PKD genetic case by case again. It depends because uh, uh, the idea is to make sure the donor is safe to donate. So if a donor uh, age uh, 30 year or older, and we do imaging test our CAT scan and there is no cyst, then we're good. We don't have to do any genetic testing in this case. Now, if a younger donor under age 30 and have no uh, cyst and imaging, we still cannot be sure that they don't have polycystic kidney disease in the future. In that case, we will consider genetic testing. I will just uh, highlight one thing here, that the cost of uh, genetic testing uh, uh, case by case, some cost uh, for the donor certainly will cover but sometimes that may include the recipient for polycystic kidney disease. But this is something we can always work out uh, with this genetic testing. Uh, other condition, uh, we screen every black donor now with sickle cell screen. Uh, and we do again, everything uh, that possible we could do to ensure low risk donor and to ensure proper counseling with donors. Uh, I'm gonna go to question number five. If my remaining kidney fails, 
will I be eligible for a transplant? Definitely. I mentioned that uh, by US uh, organ policy, a prior donor will receive uh, priority for a high quality deceased donor transplant. And as long as they are surgical candidate and they are referred to transplant center. Then I think question number six here, uh, I am a female and 29 plan on having children in the next few years. Is it best to wait until I am older to donate? Um, thank you, that's a great question. I think we touched up on this earlier. I would say that uh, for a young female, uh, healthy young female, as we mentioned, uh, risk for complication of pregnancy based on uh, a study, about 5% may develop what's called gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. If you donate, this goes up to 11%. So the risk is double, uh, but a majority of our donors who did donate, they did well. I want to also uh, emphasize that in that study, mo uh, most donors who uh, uh, had uh, preeclampsia and, um, uh, and uh, gestational hypertension, they were aged uh, above 32. So age is a player factor. So having pregnancy at younger age is much better for you. Uh, and I would say also that uh, it's really, I mean, depends on your recipient, uh, what they feel, how they're doing. Uh, if you can get your pregnancy before and you don't want to take a risk, go for it. If the recipient is suffering and you want to save their life and then go after that, after one year at least from donation, I think that's very reasonable. So at, at this age, I think you have the flexibility to do it either before or after, no problem. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me address uh, number seven and number eight. Number seven, is I think it's it's definitely case by case. It's gonna depend on the type of cancer and and how long the individual has been uh, cured. And so that's something that you would just have to submit the questionnaire and let us uh, look at the, uh, you know, kind of look at that particular uh, situation. And we might have to get records from your, you know, your oncologist. So, and the next one is um, you do need um, COVID-19 testing and we have a, we have a, a pathway for that where we test so many days out and then again right before donation. Yeah, and I just want to also like uh, about question eight, is there more need? Well, I mean, uh, the number has dropped down significantly as it should. Uh, you, there is always more need and, uh, but uh, of course uh, we have also to make sure that you guys safe uh, when we do this. Um, so question number nine, what is the cost of living in donation? So as I mentioned earlier, all costs uh, directly related to the donation will be covered by uh, insurance that including test, surgery, evaluation. However, we mentioned that there's some costs will not be covered like travel cost expenses, uh, costs uh, related to off work, but uh, we mentioned that we have social work, they may help you to offset some of this cost was not covered by the civil insurance. Number 10 is who is ineligible to donate a kidney? Anyone with inadequate kidney function uh, will not be eligible. Anyone under age 18 cannot donate a kidney. Anyone with diabetes cannot donate a kidney. Anyone obviously with active cancer or heart disease cannot donate. This is obvious uh, rule out reason. Can you please read the question that loud? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, how long will I have to stay in the hospital after surgery? Dr. Shen can answer this question. Yeah, it's uh, usually anywhere between two and four days is the standard post-op course. Yeah. So if you donate on a Monday, most people go home on Wednesday or Thursday, a few go home on Tuesday and a few go home on Friday and that's the most common um, scenario. Yes, and, and, and that's nationally. So when you look at national data, the links stay after living donation uh, about like three days. So, and uh, we want to say that you will go, uh, you will go home. You will feel a little bit tired for about the first two weeks, but then you, you will feel uh, better uh, with some activity after two weeks. But we expect you to be back to normal after six weeks. So, what other tests are involved in the screening process? Well, uh, if, a, if a donor is being referred, whether by phone or online, and where they pass their uh, medical history questionnaire, there's no like, you know, big barrier medically, uh, they will receive an order wherever they are locally, we'll send them the order for blood tests and urine tests. Uh, uh, and then if the blood and urine tests they pass, they will bring it for evaluation and counseling. And then they will move for uh, imaging tests, which include a CAT scan, uh, and uh, some uh, x-ray of the chest uh, and some uh, heart uh, cardiac workup like AKG and some sometimes we do 
uh, echocardiogram ultrasound of the heart. Um, how long um, will be uh, on medication? So Dr. Shane can answer this question. Yeah, most people uh, need pain medications for the first couple of weeks and it's usually, but most of the surgical pain is, is um, it's to the point where it's, it's much reduced by post-op day three or four and, and people are okay with just an occasional um, narcotic pill. Can I have children after donating a kidney? Yes, certainly you can. But again, uh, it depends on your age also. Uh, and we're going to counsel you. There is a small increased risk. Uh, uh, we said earlier that uh, gestation, hypertension, and preeclampsia. Uh, so we encourage our female donor, if they want to get the pregnancy first and come donate, that's fine. If they want to donate after, that's fine. The majority of donors who donated the kidney did well with pregnancy after donation. How frequently do you deny kidney donor candidates due to kidney stones? Great question. So uh, we are more supportive for kidney uh, donor, uh, potential kidney donor. It depends on the kidney stone size and uh, how many kidney stone. Uh, ideally, there will be only one stone, a small size, uh, ideally less than three millimeter. And, uh, and also the age, a big factor because we don't want to be like a 20 year old with a stone uh, even one stone, this could be a problem because age is matter. We have seen donors who at uh, early 20s and then they develop a lot, a lot of kidney stone later on in their life. So the, uh, it's case by case. Um, what are the long-term side effects of living with just one kidney? So uh, most, uh, I would say the, the data that we showed in terms of like uh, kidney failure, the risk is very small. Uh, about 0.3 of uh, uh, 0.3 uh, 1% uh, at 15 years. Uh, other issue is that uh, concern that with the reduced kidney function because um, one third of kidney function will be lost permanently. So some donors may uh, may develop fatigue uh, in the future, which is again rare. Uh, another issue like when a donor age, like let's say a donor now is age 80 or 90 years old, uh, with one kidney, are they uh, have same uh, energy as somebody with two kidneys. We expect that the case, uh, but there, there, there's lack of data for 40, 50 years or uh, follow-up data. Uh, but we, we, we will say that uh, uh, based on what we know today, uh, donors, they do very well and they enjoy their life, uh, but uh, we, there's lack of data from like a long-term follow-up. Uh, question number 17. Um, you can go for that, uh, Dr. Shane. Yeah, so 70 is how long before a donor can go back to normal heavy uh, activity? For example, if they have a job that involves heavy lifting, et cetera, can they return after six weeks? Usually is what I would say. Um, the, the incision that's lower on the abdomen, um, that is much more resistant to hernias. And so even if I have a particular patient who um, does have to do heavy lifting, I generally, after six weeks, tell him he can gradually resume normal activity, and by three months, he can, you know, be doing whatever full range of activity he did before surgery. But um, at six weeks, they that's kind of the break point where people can start building back up to where they were, and then they get there um, by three months. Uh, question 18, can I have visitor during and after surgery due, due, uh, during the pandemic, basically? Well, this has been uh, assessed every day by day by our hospital infection control. Uh, it goes, uh, it honestly depends on how many cases in the country and what is the prevalence of the, the disease in the city. So we uh, are- Currently, yes. Point. Currently, yes, but that could change next week or next month, so. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, case by case and time by time, I would say. What, uh, what, what the risk should I consider? W well, I mean, uh, we talk about uh, risk that uh, for uh, high blood pressure in the future, risk for uh, pregnancy for a young woman. Uh, we talk um, about uh, risk for cost related uh, that not uh, uh, directly related to the donation. Uh, so there are some risk. Uh, but again, we are always happy to work with you guys and uh, to take off some risk and explain to you and counsel you, make you comfortable going on, or if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you shouldn't do this. So will the recovery uh, be painful? That's a shame. Yeah, the, let me go back to the risk thing. I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're talking surgical risk, um, you know, it's, it's major surgery. 
you know, everything you can imagine, bleeding infection, need for further surgery, uh, need for hernia repairs in the future, um, need, you know, need to convert from a laparoscopic to a, a full open operation. All those things are risk. If you're talking about long-term risk, um, Dr. Alamari discussed that uh, a little bit earlier. The, um, but there, there are also, there's also time off work and there's, you know, um, lost wages and there's other things. So all that has to be considered uh, when you're coming forward to be a donor. And we certainly can counsel you on all that when you come forward. The recovery, uh, will it be painful? Um, the next question is, will the recovery be painful? The, everybody's different. And I'd say the vast majority of people, no matter what approach um, for surgery, where the incisions are, most people have uh, the most surgical pain within the first two to three days. And from day three slash four to two weeks, it gets gradually better every day. Most people, by the time they get to two weeks, are not on any narcotic pills and um, generally feel well. And then from two weeks to six weeks, it's, it's even a um, more gradual improvement. But by six weeks, most people um, have no you know, symptoms or pain or, or discomfort related to their surgery. Sure. So how do altruistic donation and kidney swabs work? So we showed a slide earlier how this works, but basically altruistic donation is a, a, a person who want to donate to someone that they don't know. And that can save many lives because once you save that life, it could trigger a big chain uh, in the kidney pair donation swab. Also, you will uh, save the kidney transplant waiting list. One disease donor will move up. So that's altruistic donation. Kidney swab, uh, again, if you're incompatible with the recipient, with their blood type or tissue type, uh, antibody, uh, we can find a ways to do this uh, by uh, doing uh, the participation in, in kidney swab program uh, through a national uh, programs to make it easier and um, find more compatible uh, kidney for the recipient. How long is the general timeline from yeah, calling pause. for appointment? Yeah, go yeah ahead. pause. Let me address this one. I think for the next question is how long is the general timeline from calling for an appointment to the day of surgery? That's highly variable. Um, we like to keep it as short as possible. Uh, it's going to depend to some degree on um, how rapidly we can get the labs and how rapidly after the labs have been reviewed, you can get in for get into Hopkins for um, all the additional studies. And then whether a particular donor is going to need um, further consults, whether for echocardiography or to see infectious disease, um, so it, it can be a it can be a highly variable timeline. Yes, and is the process faster for kidney donation versus deceased donation? Definitely, a living donation we say based on studies that less than one year to complete uh, from referral to donation, and for deceased donation uh, approximately. The recipient may wait for approximately five years, and this again is very varied between uh, person to another. Uh, must I be related to the recipient, and is the donor information confidential? Well, again, you don't have to be related to the recipient, as we show earlier. That first time in history that unrelated donor has exceeded uh, biologically related donor uh, uh, for uh, living kidney donation. So anyone can do this. And uh, the information for the donor, yes, it is confidential. And uh, if you come as altruistic donor, or even we always uh, going to be uh, support your request. Uh, how is the kidney removes uh, surgery? I will leave this for Dr. Uh, uh, Shane, 25 and 26. The kidney, uh, so the kidney lives in the back of the abdomen. All the intestines have to be rotated off of it. Um, the the vessels are sealed with a stapler. Um, the kidney is then usually placed in a bag and, and then removed through one of the larger incision in the in the diagram that I showed you earlier, whether it's the one around the belly button or the one lower. Um, but that's that's how it's removed. And then it's flushed on the back table with a preservation solution. And then if it's being used at this here at this hospital, it you know it gets put in this in the recipient either you know, later that day in the same room or it goes to another room or it gets put in a box and shipped if it's part of the part of the um, NKR or the, or the parrot exchange. Uh, you, you will have scars. You'll have a scar um, just to most of us, you, you'll have a scar just above your pubic bone um, that goes uh, sideways. And then you'll have the smaller scars from um, 
the laparoscopic ports. There's no way to take a kidney out. So anyone that says that they have scarless surgery, that's just, that's not possible. You have to, you have to make an incision and any incision heals with a scar. Okay, will I have to return to the hospital for a checkup? Yes, so the donor will come to the hospital uh, about one to two weeks after donation to make sure they're healing well and uh, the wound is healing well. And then after that, uh, we'll do blood and urine test at six months at one year, at two years, which is required by uh, the policy for organ donation. And thereafter, we ask you to do every year blood and urine test with your primary care doctor. At any point, if you develop any medical problem, we would like uh, uh, we'd like you to let us know, and we'll be happy to help as much as we can, um, and we'll be supportive at any time. And then, what lifestyle changes should I anticipate? So we expect you honestly to be go back to normal after six weeks of donation, but some donors they may have developed some things that unexpected. For example, uh, maybe one of the things we we have seen. Uh, uncommonly that uh, the potassium in the blood goes up, uh, uh, not like uh, normal potassium donors sometimes has. Then we ask them to cut down potassium in their diet. Uh, some donors may develop in the future high blood pressure or they need to be in low salt diet and maybe they need to be on medication for blood pressure. Uh, if you do heavy duty, uh, as Dr. Shane uh, mentioned, you may have to do this gradually. If you do heavy exercise, you may have to go back uh, gradually. So you have to be willing to uh, be accepting there might be lifestyle changes if needed. But again, the majority of donors, we expect it to go back uh, to back to their normal life as before donation after six weeks. Uh, Dr. Shane, you want to answer question 29? Yeah, so um, I'll reinforce most people go back to their previous quality of life and function. And uh, that's you know the vast, vast, vast majority of donors. What is cross-matching? It's just, um, it's a laboratory technique that we use to test the particular, the recipient's um, blood with, with the donor's tissue to make sure that the recipient doesn't have a reactivity to that tissue that would make the transplant um, less successful. The, the next question is, are there organizations that can help patients afford the cost of transplantation? Yes, they're, they're several organizations that do um, help defray the cost of transplant or of donation. Um, not every, again, not everybody is eligible for those programs based on income, um, but the, our social workers can help um, potential donors navigate those programs. The next question is, if I had COVID-19, can I still donate? Uh, we think yes, we would put you through um, some rigorous testing and we'd run it by our ID folks. But in general, if you've had COVID-19 and recovered and you're testing negative, then generally we think that that's probably okay. Yes, and are there any age restriction in living donation? So you must be 18 years or older to be a donor and there is no other age limit as long as you are healthy and you have adequate kidney function. That's a great question and we see a lot. Perfect. So, I, I mean, really, I mean, uh, this is very exciting. Uh, we, what can I do if I'm not able to donate, but still want to help someone who needs a kidney transplant? Uh, what a great person uh, you are. If, if you cannot donate for medical reason uh, or other reason, you can be the ambassador. You can be the champion for the recipient where you can, uh, we have uh, some program we have seen that, uh, a champion or ambassador for the recipient go to social media. Some people they go to Facebook, and you uh, basically uh, trying to um, uh, promote people to uh, give a kidney, uh, whether to that particular recipient or others. We have seen this done in communities, in church, a uh, place for, for worship. So really, I mean, uh, you can do a lot. And we'll be happy to you know, share any information if you have any uh, more uh, interest in that regard. So, um, so I think this has been great, really. Um, we just want to say uh, saving a life and uh, really, I mean, this living kidney donation, uh, we want to just highlight, uh, it is uh, a small risk uh, procedure, but it's not zero risk. And uh, we'll be happy to, you know, answer any more question if it comes up uh, later on. And uh, please spread the word and share this with others.
Thank you for your uh, interest in being a living God.